So, you've spent a lot of time arguing online with the GCs and other assorted transphobes. So have I. After a while, it all blends together into a parfait of bad faith, illogic, and conspiratorial reasoning. It seems like no matter the time or place, they all say the same things over and over again. Trans people reinforce gender stereotypes. Medical transition is bad. Trans people have only been around since Tumblr. Big Pharma is making money off of transing your kids. Trans women will always be stronger and more violent. I care about trans people, I just have reasonable concerns. No matter how many times you defeat those arguments, they always come back, like hungry zombies. Trans. It almost sounds as though they're reading from a script, one which they've been using for years. What if I told you that there was a script? That almost all of their arguments can be traced back to a single book published in 1979. I can take you there and all will be revealed. Let's go back to 1979. Janice Raymond was a Catholic nun who left the convent and pursued further education. After completing her PhD, she expanded upon her thesis about trans people. However, even though she was no longer a nun, she still maintained much of the dogma of the Catholic Church, such as the patriarchal nature of the institution, opposition to abortion providers, an emphasis on socially conservative absolute morality, and the Catholic Church's view of trans people. Welcome to the Transsexual Empire. Part 2. Arguments Each of those zombie arguments can be found in this book. Let's look at one of the most pernicious, most popular anti-trans arguments of today and then, that trans people reinforce gender stereotypes. Maybe the most common GC argument is that the existence of trans people inherently reinforces gender stereotypes, or that all trans people conform to stereotypes. Raymond may not have invented this argument, but she brought it to a wide audience, as it is repeated heavily through her book. She is convinced that trans people only embody stereotypes. On a social level, the transsexual becomes a living opponent of a gender-free society by virtue of his uncritical acceptance of and comfortable conformity to the stereotypes of masculinity and femininity. One problem, which trans people have dealt with since the beginning of medical transition, is medical gatekeeping. Trans people often have to overperform stereotypes of their gender identity in order to access transition care, and may be denied care if they don't. This is still an issue today, and was even more so during the 1970s. And Raymond knew this. In fact, they must prove they are real before they are accepted for treatment. However, despite knowing this, she still continues to blame trans people. For fuck's sake, if someone told me that my medical care was dependent on whether or not I fulfilled stereotypes, then I would absolutely lie to my clinicians and tell them I was wearing my mom's suits and my dad's dresses since they were seven and I wasn't even born yet. And I've always felt a spiritual connection to blow high since before there was even Ikea. The transsexual seeks out, with the help of transsexual technicians, another mode of behavior modification, which is transsexual treatment and surgery and goes on to assert the common transphobe conclusion that trans people reinforce patriarchy. Transsexual surgery is a social tranquilizer. For the sake of health and well-being, the status quo of patriarchy is strengthened. This is clearly false. Patriarchy does not see trans people of any gender as fellow patriarchs, but as traitors and transgressors. The kind of people who see women as objects see trans women not as better than objects, but as counterfeit objects. As shown in our video on GCs and the religious right, patriarchal conservatives are behind most of the attacks on trans people, so it makes no sense to claim that trans people are an arm of the patriarchy. And if we were, this is also why virtually every major feminist organization in the world supports trans people, much to the chagrin of transphobes who would claim to be feminist. Meanwhile, if trans people don't conform, Raymond also hates them. From her chapter on trans lesbians, What is also typical masculine in the case of transsexually constructed lesbian feminists is the appropriation of women's minds, convictions of feminism, and sexuality. Here, Raymond asserts two things. First, that lesbians, or at least trans lesbians, are typically masculine. 
This is a homophobic stereotype, and also a line we see promoted by contemporary transphobes, albeit in a different context. Modern transphobes will often use this stereotype against trans youth, asserting that any child who is assigned female at birth and is masculine will grow up to be a lesbian, or any feminine child assigned male at birth will be a gay man. Presumably, if they actually cared about gay children, they wouldn't promote homophobic stereotypes. Similarly, if Raymond actually supported lesbians, cis or trans, she wouldn't push homophobic stereotypes. She is also creating a no-win situation for trans women. Feminine and or straight, uh, then you're reinforcing stereotypes. Masculine and or gay, uh, you, then you're too manly and appropriating feminism. Oh, and God help you if you're bi, pan, ace, or otherwise don't fit the stereotypes in Janus Raymond's head. Raymond also holds up another familiar claim, that trans people should just live as gender non-conforming cis people. Does transsexual treatment and surgery repress the transsexual's capacity for social protests and restrict her or his potential as a social critic in the sexist society that caused the problem to begin with? Given that patriarchy is heavily opposed to the existence of trans people, it seems that transitioning is an act of societal defiance, not one of submission. Most trans people who transition do so to relieve dysphoria and feel more in line with their bodies. A key tenet of feminism is bodily autonomy, including allowing people to modify their bodies through medical transition. Raymond appears to be suggesting that trans people should suffer for her sociopolitical goal, which is both a violation of bodily autonomy and also supposes that people should forsake their own lives for what she believes. As such, this loaded question is just another blank. Another commonality between Raymond and modern transphobes is medical fear-mongering. The first chapter of the book is filled with graphic descriptions of transition surgery and dire warnings about the risks of hormones, which parallel these folks. This saves her and her allies the need to produce a coherent argument by replacing it with shock value. It also poisons the well for further discussion of transition, as her audience's first reaction will be to think of what she's told them and will stick in the readers' minds for the rest of the book. Having this topic early on also allows her to conflate being trans with medical transition. These are not the same. Being trans is the state of having a gender identity which doesn't match that which was assigned at birth, while medical transition is the process of using hormones and surgery to change one's body. The former has been around since prehistory, while the latter has been developed within the last century. Many trans people medically transition, but not all trans people do, and it's not a requirement for being trans. The distinction should be obvious, but presenting the two as the same serves multiple purposes. First, it allows transphobes to claim that trans people are unnatural, a creation of male doctors for patriarchal purposes. Raymond rests heavily on this idea, claiming that the real cause of transsexualism, patriarchy, and the legions of therapeutic fathers who create transsexuals according to their man-made designs and specifications. Which only makes sense if trans people are viewed through this exclusively medical lens, which requires some serious historical revisionism. Looking at the fields of anthropology, cultural studies, and history, trans and non-binary identities have existed for thousands of years around the world. When European Christian colonizers took over large swaths of the world, one of their methods of oppression was forcing people to conform to a gender binary. Over the last century, trans people have been able to achieve medical support to transition and to achieve recognition in many countries, but this is not because trans people only came into existence during the last century. Saying trans people have only existed since the 20th century would be similar to saying that gay people didn't exist until countries legalized gay marriage. But it helps Raymond and friends, because they can then also claim that trans people are a recent occurrence. Meanwhile, the very existence of this book disproves some of the historical revision that contemporary transphobes promote. It's common for gender-critical people to claim that trans lesbians, or some other trans identity, have only been around since the internet in order to invalidate it. This book, published in 1979, acknowledges the existence of queer trans people, albeit portraying them in a very negative light, disproving that argument. The transphobic conflation of medical transition and trans identity also provides a bolster for the aforementioned claim that trans people reinforce stereotypes. As previously stated, throughout trans history, trans people have been forced to conform to stereotypes in order to access treatment. By painting trans people as only existing because of medical transition, Raymond and her compatriots can use that medical gatekeeping to further advance the idea that trans people only exist because of stereotypes. 
What will go unexamined is patriarchy's norms of masculinity and femininity, and how these norms, if allowed to contain persons within such rigid boundaries, may generate such a phenomenon as transsexualism. As we've discussed, she knows that the medical establishment has foisted this upon trans people, and thereby produced this self-fulfilling prophecy. But by positioning trans people as purely a medical curiosity, she can not only claim that trans people reinforce stereotypes, but that they only exist because of those stereotypes. This is an extreme position, but not that far removed from some of the claims modern GCs make about trans people. Raymond's focus on medicine also leads us to another prominent theme of GCism, conspiracy theories. These conspiracies take a variety of targets of ire, but one common focus is medicine. Belief in a medical conspiracy is very common among transphobes, and Raymond is no exception. Many of these conspiracy theories are also closely related to white nationalist conspiracy theories. The Great Replacement Theory is a white nationalist conspiracy theory claiming that white people are being replaced by minorities in an orchestrated manner. Janice Raymond promotes a similar idea, that cisgender women are being replaced by trans women in a manner laid out by doctors. One hypothesis that is being tested in the transsexual laboratories is whether or not it is possible for men to diminish the number of women and or create a new breed of females. Again, I would emphasize that this is not a mere feminist flight of fantasy. Scientists have already stated their scientific interest in diminishing the numbers of women. Her citation for this is a paper by a cis man about sex selective abortion and reducing numbers of women that has nothing to do with trans people. Countries where selective abortions are prevalent are generally not countries with gay nor trans acceptance, and there's reason to believe that the places where one might abort a female fetus, they would also selectively abort gay, lesbian, and trans people were it possible to detect those traits in utero. Yet she holds this as evidence for a secret plan to replace cis women with trans women. In reality, there is no such plan in place. Trans women make up 0.6% of all women, so if they're supposed to be replacing cis women, they're doing a very bad job. Raymond also employs another conspiracy stalwart, the slippery slope. This is a logical fallacy, where one argues that a far-fetched negative conclusion will result from a harmless precedent, and therefore, the precedent is bad. An example of the slippery slope fallacy in action is homophobes who claim that legalizing gay marriage leads to human-animal marriage, which is clearly not the case. However, Raymond takes her slippery slope in a different direction entirely. As the gender identity clinics expand and the tolerance for transsexual surgery grows, it is not inconceivable that such clinics could become sex role control centers for deviant non-feminine females and non-masculine males, as well as the transsexuals. Such gender identity centers are already being used for the treatment of designated child transsexuals. The use of behavior modification and control is presently very widespread. It is fast becoming a tool of American law enforcement and funding for it from state and government sources has been documented. Furthermore, we can safely predict on the basis of past and present CIA and FBI activities that if gender identity facilities became government controlled, some gender modification activities would be reported while others would be repressed from public view. Only those offering a therapeutic rationale would be revealed. Moreover, such controllers and centers for control, such as John Hopkins and UCLA, would continue to have a very specific philosophy about what women and men should be, how they should act, and what functions they should perform in society. In fact, gender identity clinic research and treatment has already been funded by grants from the National Institute of Mental Health and government-affiliated funding sources. All this is happening, and will continue to happen, of course, in the name of science and therapy, and with the denial that any social engineering is taking place. Here we have institutional sexism at its most functional capacity, a dystopian perspective, some will say. But such perspectives have a way of highlighting present and future reality by daring to predict what most persons do not or choose not to perceive. The point is that sex roles already do not have to be forced upon people. Most quickly give informed consent. But feminism has been fast chipping away as an institution of sexual conditioning in this society. Threatened commentators from a patriarchal perspective have been quick to call feminism sexual suicide. Justice doctors Vernon Mark, William Sweet, and Frank Irvin 
suggested in the Journal of the American Medical Association that psychotechnology could be used for the repression of violence in the Detroit Ghetto Rebellion of 1967. It is not inconceivable that doctors X, Y, and Z could propose sexual technology for the repression of sexual deviancy. It has been done before, e.g. clitoridectomies, and it can be done again. It would all be part of parasol and present voluntaristic therapies for the repression of deviancy. Individuals undergo psychosurgery giving informed consent. Parents, on advice of school administrators and physicians, sign informed consent papers to have Ritalin administered to their children in public school centers. Women consentingly undergo unnecessary hysterectomies for prophylactic reasons such as the vague threat of uterine cancer. Imagine a prophylactic penectomy. <sighs> There's a lot going on here. Raymond thinks that allowing transition will mean that gender non-conforming children and adults will be forced to transition by the U.S. government. Keeping in mind that this was written 40 years ago, from this we can take away two insights. One, this is an argument GCs still use today, though usually without implicating the CIA. It's also something that is no closer to happening today than it was in 1979, meaning they should maybe find a new argument? Two, Raymond's scaremongering about child transition as experimental is very similar to the line being promoted now by transphobes seeking to restrict it. If it was experimental then, it certainly isn't now, 40 years later. Forced or coerced transition is not what happens in any gender clinic ever. Parents cannot override their child's wish and force them to take blockers. That has never happened once, only ever the opposite. Parents vetoing a child who wishes to pursue blockers, and transphobes trying to veto when both the child wants blockers and the parents agree with the supervision of a doctor. Even detransitioners don't make the claim that transition was forced on them, they know they'd be called out for the obvious lie, but instead say they weren't gatekept hard enough. She also goes in a number of other downright bizarre directions, with the claim that trans people are somehow responsible for cis women getting unnecessary surgeries, to her opposition to informed consent, which is at the root of all modern healthcare, to her opposition to medication for children, to the bits about the government. Is this the kind of person that should be taken seriously? GCs think so. Much like her modern counterparts, Raymond is also very interested in bioessentialism, or the belief that people's lives are determined purely by their biology as measured. In this case, it means she thinks that biological sex, as she defines it, should determine everything about someone's life. Much like many modern transphobes, Raymond thinks that cis women are biologically inferior to trans women, but she takes it a step further with the idea that cis women will be replaced by trans women, as mentioned. This doesn't sound very feminist, and isn't. If all cis women are biologically always less than cis men or trans women, what's the point of feminism? Nothing will ever change. It also provides a justification for patriarchy. If cis men are biologically better, presumably they should run everything. It's also the same logic which excuses sexual predators. If boys will be boys, then how can we do anything about it? However, despite Raymond's insistence on the importance of biological sex, she can't seem to decide what determines sex. Sometimes it's chromosomes. Women take on the self-definition of feminist and or lesbian because that definition truly proceeds from not only from the chromosomal fact of being born double X, but also from the whole history of what being born with those chromosomes mean in this society. Until it isn't chromosomes. Furthermore, Chromosomes are only one defining factor. In the context of total history of what it means to be a woman or a man, in a society that treats women and men differently on the basis of biological sex. And she can't make up her mind about whether there is or isn't innate female socialization. We know that we are women who are born with female chromosomes and anatomy, and that whether or not we are socialized to be so-called normal women, Patriarchy has treated and will treat us like women. Transsexuals have not had the same history. No man can have the history of being born and located in this culture as a woman. He can have the history of wishing to be a woman and of acting like a woman, but this gender experience is that of a transsexual, not of a woman. Surgery may confer the artifacts of outward and inward female organs, but it cannot confer the history of being born a woman in this society. 
So either you were or weren't given female socialization, but regardless, there is one universal female experience that all cis women have and no trans women have? How is that supposed to make sense? Schrodinger's female socialization, everyone! The reality, as always, is that science, and biology in particular, affirms the existence of trans people. Which is why all of Raymond's bioessentialism is contradictory and anti-feminist. But it's the same arguments GCs use today. Maybe they should find some new arguments. These ones are a bit stale. Many modern transphobes love to bring up other problems which exist unrelated to trans people. Favorite targets include genital mutilation, various medical conditions, and homophobia. As might be expected by this point, Raymond is no different in wanting to divert attention. It is this kind of scientific fixation, among other things, that impels doctors to pursue transsexual surgery when there are so many more pressing concerns. When our maternal morbidity and infant mortality statistics are outrageously high. When there are still no adequate or foolproof means of birth control. And when breast cancer ranks as one of the greatest killers of women. In other words, transsexual surgery is unnecessary surgery performed in part because of the objective knowledge that it offers to researchers and technicians on a subject that is not knowable from other sources. It diverts time, attention, energy, and research money away from other medical areas that are more pressing and need attention. It provides a marketplace, so to speak, for the surgical talents of doctors, and it battens doctors' wallets. First off, trans healthcare receives significantly less funding than the other items Raymond mentioned. Second, these are all issues which affect trans people as well, so framing them as diametrically opposed to trans rights and healthcare is disingenuous. And third, it's possible to do multiple things at once. To paraphrase a certain US president, we ought to be able to walk and swallow estrogen pills at the same time. Most of the practices in trans healthcare also have implications for cis people as well, and many were originally developed for cis people. Hormone replacement therapy was first pioneered for cis people with hormone imbalances, such as cis women undergoing menopause or cis men with low testosterone levels. Transition surgeries like vaginoplasty and phalloplasty were originally developed for cis women and men who were born without or suffered damage to their genitals. Advances to these techniques benefit cis and trans people alike. But moreover, Raymond doesn't actually care about any of these things or the people they affect, and nor do her modern counterparts. None of them actually do anything about the issues they bring up. They just use them and the people they affect as weapons to hurt trans people. Just like how MRAs bring up issues that do affect men, such as suicide rates or sexual abuse of men and boys, but then don't do anything about them and blame them on feminists. Perhaps the most obnoxious aspect of many modern GCs is how they frame their hate. They know that they're being hateful, but still insist that they care and are concerned. So, I want trans women to be safe. At the same time, I do not want to make nasal girls and women less safe. Janice Raymond is no different here. She knows full well that she hates trans people and that her book is a hate manifesto, but she also doesn't want to admit she's hateful. Instead, she pretends it's out of concern. There are deviant males and their particular manifestation of gender deviancy needed its own unique context of peer support. This sort of concern that trans people are deviants in need of a unique context of peer support is the same line as Christian groups which profess a love the sinner, hate the sin narrative and see trans and gay people as in need of spiritual help, which is unsurprising given Raymond's Catholic background. The young need to be helped to accept their own body as it was created. For thinking that we enjoy absolute power over our own bodies turns, often subtly, into thinking that we enjoy absolute power over creation. Speaking of Catholicism... Part 3. Religion. As mentioned before, Janice Raymond was previously a Catholic nun before leaving the convent and pursuing further education, which led her to write The Transsexual Empire. However, when people leave a conservative religious group, they often retain bits of its ideology and outlook. This is quite visible in Raymond's work, which, as we've established, maintains a similar line to the Catholic Church on trans people, but also in her views on pain and suffering. Raymond dislikes medicine's focus on reducing pain, speaking negatively about a medical model which stresses freedom from physical or mental pain or disease. 
This is directly in line with the Catholic Church's historic position that suffering is a beneficial spiritual existence. Mother Teresa, arguably the most famous Catholic religious figure of the 20th century, spoke for her religion when she said, I think it is very beautiful for the poor to accept their lot, to share it with the passion of Christ. I think the world is being much helped by the suffering of the poor people. The belief that suffering is beneficial is a cruel, sadistic view which Raymond has kept from Catholicism. It is one which is counter to basic medical ethics, which seek to do no harm. It is one which should not be tolerated in anyone weighing in on medical matters. And it fits perfectly with the GC view on trans people, that they should suffer. Raymond also projects the religious nature of her own views onto transition and medicine itself, declaring that medicine is a cult. This too is in keeping with modern GC beliefs that trans people or transition are a cult. However, it's all projection. As a person of former monasticism, she sees everything in this religious framework. Raymond views all of medicine through this framework, which is patently absurd, but not more so than her modern counterparts who believe similarly, if less openly. But Raymond's religious views stretch beyond projecting a religious framework onto medicine and factor into her beliefs about an answer to trans people's existence. Setting aside for a moment how it is genocidal to seek an answer to any minority, her answer is based heavily in spiritual and immaterial concepts. Those who advocate transsexualism emphasize certain values. Primarily, the transsexual empire promotes integration. In this chapter, I propose an ethic of integrity. There is a crucial distinction between integration and integrity. She goes on to define those two concepts in a way that is closely linked to Christian religious beliefs. What I call an ethic of integrity is an attempt to discuss an original unity before the fall of sexual stereotyping. The androgyne is a myth and like all myths, is constantly reinterpreted depending on different preoccupations and experiences. But a primary common element in all that the very uses of androgyny is the notion of integration as completion. Now, hold on. It sounds like Janice thinks that trans people are a religion seeking to reconstruct androgyny in a mythic way to reach completion? What? This makes less sense the longer I look at it, and doesn't make any sense unless you go in with the assumption that trans people are a religious group, which is false. Thus, it's a pretty useless conjecture. Similarly, her concept of integrity is rooted in the naturalistic fallacy, the idea that because something originated in nature or is a certain way from birth means it's the best way. This is a common feature of religious conservatism, where the natural or traditional, whether it is actually natural or not, is framed as superior. But it's all nonsense. For example, asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral, but is extremely carcinogenic and toxic. Meanwhile, there are plenty of things which are fully synthetic that are safe or healthy. Long story short, whether something is natural, with that definition variable as it is, or not, has little bearing on whether it's a good idea. In this case, transition, which uses bioidentical hormones, is strongly correlated with better life outcomes for trans people. Yet Raymond would prefer we follow her spiritual beliefs instead of science. And this gets at something core to GC ideology, science versus belief, and the confusion of the two. Transphobes claim to be upholding science or biology in the face of anti-scientific trans people. But that simply isn't the case. The overwhelming consensus from actual doctors, biologists, psychologists, anthropologists, and historians is that trans people do exist and that transition is beneficial. Transphobes prefer to write this off as institution capture or blame conspiracies. And the GCs know that they're wrong about it too. When Maya Forstadter's case was tried, she claimed that her transphobia was a philosophical belief. Since the scientific consensus does not support her views, she knew that she could only present it as a belief akin to religion. The same is true of Raymond and of GC transphobia in general. It is unscientific, more akin to religious or cult beliefs, but they attempt to present it as somehow scientific or greater than science while calling trans people the ideologues and the existence of trans people an ideology. The persistence of faith over science results in some moral absolutes, which are dangerous by virtue of being. Which brings us to the climax. Not the fun kind. Part 4. 
the climax, not the fun kind. I have argued that the issue of transsexualism is an ethical issue that has profound political and moral ramifications. Transsexualism itself is a deeply moral question rather than a medical technical answer. I contend that the problem of transsexualism would be best be served by morally mandating it out of existence. Whoa. It seems pretty genocidal to refer to any minority as an issue or question. The Nazis, for example, referred to the Jewish question, and the Ottomans referred to the Armenian question as justification for their respective genocides. And I can't really see a reading of morally mandating it out of existence that is good for trans people. While Raymond does not outright say that she wants to kill trans people, she does say that it should be made much harder to access transition and support. Along with first cause legislation to stop the procreation of transsexualism, limiting legislation is also necessary to inhibit the massive medical technical complex of institutions that promote and perform more treatment and more surgery. Such institutions have a built-in growth power and thus legal limits should be placed on their ability to multiply. I will favor restricting the number of hospitals and centers where transsexual surgery could be performed. This parallels modern GC efforts to a T, where she mentions stopping the procreation of transsexualism, her contemporary counterparts similarly advocate barring education about trans people, referring to it as gender ideology and trying to ban it from schools the same way homophobes hoped that Section 28 would prevent more gay people from coming into existence. They would also like to reduce access to healthcare or remove it altogether, much as she favored restricting it. She's also a proponent of forcing trans people to be cis. What I advocate, instead of counseling that issues in a medicalization of transsexuals suffering, is a counseling based on consciousness raising. This is a more polite way of saying that trans people should not transition and instead go through therapy to change themselves mentally and desist. If only there were a name for that. And today, similarly, transphobes want this to be legal and have obstructed efforts to ban it. This is the GC endgame, to make transition so difficult and force trans people into conversion therapy so that trans people no longer can exist in public life. This is what they want. And they won't stop at trans people. Because not only is GCism transphobic, but it's also rooted in homophobia and misogyny, and Raymond is no different. Throughout her work, she promotes the idea of political lesbianism, which says that women can choose their sexual orientation and reframes being gay as a political choice. This is obviously homophobic, as sexuality is not a political choice and uses the same logic as conservatives who believe that people can and should choose to be straight instead of gay. She also invests deeply in homophobic stereotypes of lesbians and gay men, suggesting that lesbians are overly masculine and gay men feminine. While some lesbians are masculine and some gay men feminine, the idea that all the members in both groups are so is a homophobic stereotype. In particular, she levels this stereotype at trans lesbians, declaring them to be too obviously masculine. We can also see it today in modern GCs, who claim that childhood transition is forcing cis gay or lesbian children to become trans, an idea which relies on gay equaling gender non-conforming, which is also self-defeating logic because it relies on the premise of a natural tendency of males to masculinity and females to femininity, in contradiction to other major premises she relies on, and that being gay inverts this tendency somehow with no explanation, much less any explanation that makes sense. Aside from the homophobia and transphobia, Raymond and the movement she spawned are also deeply misogynistic. As I said before, the idea of women as inferior or solely useful for reproduction is not feminism. Instead, it is the practice of patriarchy, which also shares in the homophobia and transphobia of gender critical feminism. Sex essentialism and biological determinism are not liberation, but have been the means of oppressors for centuries to perpetuate sexism and racism. Raymond's religious background may also be to blame for this, as Catholicism is a very patriarchal religion. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. For the man is not the woman, but the woman of the man. Not very feminist, is it? 
We might even say <laughs> feminisms. And in true feminist tradition, Raymond found an audience with noted supporter of women's rights. Uh, let me check. Um, the Reagan administration? In 1980, the National Center for Healthcare Technology commissioned Raymond to write an ethics report on transition. Riding on the popularity of the transsexual empire, she repeated many of the same ideas almost verbatim, detailing how trans healthcare should be heavily restricted and not receive more funding or research. The government listened, and in 1981, public funding for transition care was cut. The policy would have an impact for decades, a lasting fiscal legacy of Janice Raymond's work. Part 5. Conclusion. As you can see, this book is not only a hate manifesto, but one that spawned arguments that are still seeing use today. These arguments are no more true today than they were 40 years ago, so maybe it's time for today's bigots to get some new arguments. Or not, since they probably wouldn't be any better. And it says a lot that this is whom GCs take their arguments from. Would you listen to someone like Janice Raymond? I wouldn't, no matter how many layers of mock concern and pseudo-philosophy she dresses her transphobia with. So why give any credence to the copy of a copy circulating today? You should make your voice heard. Leave no room for these tired lies and misrepresentations. Tell the world that you won't stand for this. Demand better. Go. Make your call. I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without turfs and transphobes, without bigots or gatekeepers. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. Hey, thanks for sticking around until the end. If you made it this far, why not let us know by writing a comment down below? Just say, I'm still here, you silly fox, or something like that, I don't know. As always, a very special thanks goes out to our Patreon supporters. Without them, all of this hard work would not have been possible. If you want your name featured in this list, please consider becoming a patron yourself. The link is in the description. CritFax is a grassroots LGBT plus activist movement, and for many of us disabled queer folks, online content such as this is our only source of income. In case you were wondering, this video was narrated by me, Jangle Science Lad. You can find me over at Jangle Science Lad on YouTube and at Jangle's Lad on Twitter for as long as supplies last. Until next time. <laughs>